Okay, welcome my wonderful Year 10 class. We've got our final little section of our course. We're looking at natural selection. So how does this actually work on humans? What has happened in our history? Now, this is the third time I try and record this. I keep on going over time, so I'll have to be a bit quicker. Um, so, humans are primates. We belong to this group of animals that are known as the primates. They go back quite a long way to, well, we haven't any shrews. They have these little tiny shrews. Um, these beautiful slow loris from Indonesia, the lemurs you'd all know from Madagascar, of course, and our close relatives, the chimps and bonobos. So we share with these guys a hand that grasps, holds onto sticks and, you know, swings through trees and stuff. We've got bicuspid teeth, isn't it? Oh, yeah. um, short nose, really, re relatively. A well-developed set of eyes, so we've, and particularly for stereoscopic vision, so they're forward-facing, despite the fact we're not predators, we have forward-facing eyes, and of course allowed us to leap from tree to tree, which came rather handy. And we've got a lovely big brain, huge capacity for thought and memory and stuff that isn't shared by many species, of course. Um, and then we belong to this group known as the hominids. We're hominins, which is a group within the hominids, and the hominids are all our relatives, our closest relatives, the gorilla. The big animal there, the lovely orangutan, and these chimps and bonobos. So essentially, we have no tail. We have a large, reasonably large body size, maybe not as big as a gorilla. Um, a complex cerebral cortex. So we have this ability to think and use tools. A characteristic upper jaw has a lower jaw hinged off it, and the frontal bones of the skull are quite characteristic of of this group. And against all that, forward looking, we have. Peripheral visions reduced because we're now focusing on stereo in stereo vision. Um, what's the evidence for this? Our evolution from these animals? Well, when you look at the mitochondrial evidence, the sequences of mitochondria, it's possible to find how closely related we are by using that idea of um, uh, <laughs> I've forgotten the term, isn't that terrible? When we put our DNA together and forces that come apart and re yeah, explain that in the last video and the name will not come to me is that outrageous anyway we've used that with mitochondrial dna from our relatives and ourselves and found that um, essentially we are most closely related to the chimps and bonobos so they branched we all branched off from a common ancestor at a point in time and then the bonobos and chimps branched again uh, from another common ancestor of theirs before that there was a branched off to the gorilla and before that a branch off to the orangutan and you go back into all the, the primates. Um, so the, the DNA suggests that has occurred, and that's the manner in which the, the, the timings that's occurred, and the um, and the period of time it's taken to do it. Um, so we classify ourselves as eukarya. We belong. To, we have eukaryotic cells. We are members of the kingdom Animalia. We have a, a series of vertebrae with a a not a cord rain down them, so we belong to the phylum cordata. We are of the class mammalia, so we have mammary glands and hair on our bodies. We are of the subclass theria, so we have actually our placental mammals, we give birth to live young. Uh, we belong to this order of primates, of which we then belong to the family of hominidae, and then the genus Homo, so we are the hominins, the last extant species of our genus, Homo sapien. And some people describe it as Homo sapien sapien to uh, indicate the modern form. So what's it to be human? Well, we walk fully upright. We have fewer and smaller teeth. We have a flat face and lack a heavy brow ridge. Um, we have a larger cranial capacity than almost all other animals on the planet, that is body weight to brain size. And we make tools, chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans are quite good at making tools too, so our tool making is more of a hominid thing. We use language and art. Now, other animals use sounds to communicate, but we have, actually have quite sophisticated language. And we're not the only animal species that can use art, but we do use it for communication in a more sophisticated manner. Um, are other, other animals self-aware? Mm -hmm. The research is certainly starting to call some of the stuff into question. But a lot of these things are very um, anthropocentric, putting us, the humans, at the centre of the thought, and of course it makes us special, but 
there's self-awareness and other animals we believe these days. So those last three are sort of called into question a little bit by recent research. So there are four genera of hominin us. They start with Saleanthropus about seven million years ago. Very ape-like brain case. And you can see this brow ridge. I just went to point on the screen then. Uh, this is brow ridge here. A short face though, um, but slanted and more human smaller teeth. And then we see the Ossopithecines, and we know these were starting to walk fully upright, so they're bipedal rather than quadrupedal. Um, very much human-like hands, chimp-like in their brain and, and skull size. Uh, large face, and that brow ridge is still there, but human-like teeth. And we know three species, or recognise three species, and Afarensis is the famous one, because uh, Lucy, who was found uh, by Don Johansson, um, many years ago is uh, is an Australopithecus afarensis and she's quite famous. The other group around the same time are the Paranthropus and these guys are much more robust and probably more gorilla-like in many ways. Very strong sacral crest, crest here to have muscles down holding this jawbone in place. It's a very strong jaw, not like we have now. Um, but otherwise they're very similar to Australopithecus, it's just bigger, bigger and stronger. And so you see this in the name Robustus. These are often called the Robusts, and the other ones less so. Um, but they occur around the same time. And then we start to see Homos appear, our group. And the first of those dated is uh, Rudifensis, to found the same sort of area that uh, Lucy was, in the Olduvai Gorge and around Lake Turkana, about two and a half million years ago. A smaller brain capacity now, but obviously starting to develop for other chimpanzees. Um, Homo habilis started to show even um, more uh, human-like characteristics, slightly larger brain capacity, considered to be one of the first tool makers and tool users. Well, it's hard to prove that, of course. We have these two species called Agaster and Erectus, and there's, I don't know why we have two species. Most people in this area think they're the same thing, apart from Augusta stayed in Africa and Erectus left. Um, I don't know. The arguments around this sort of stuff is, is huge, and many people's careers are bound up in it, so it becomes quite a strange space. But they were certainly starting to develop brain capacity like ours, um, and therefore more, more ability to communicate, although they still lacked the defined larynx structure that we have to create these more refined sounds. So while they're probably communicating with language and art, it's not the same as what you see in modern humans. Um, and then we get a group of animals, not animals, a group of our genus, they existed with us. Hodobogensis was originally only known for a single jawbone, it's still not known for many bones at all. And the Anathals lived for about same sort of time frame as we did, and we, so for some reason they disappeared 3,000 years ago. So they were around when Homo sapiens were around. And certainly would have uh, crossed over, and we know there's Neanderthal genes in our gene pool. They had bigger brains than we do. They were a bigger bodied, heavier um, animal than we are. Big, heavy brow ridges. Weak chin, chin, which is interesting. But we know from their from sites where their bones are found that they had elaborate cultural displays, so that their burial sites are quite interesting. In that sense. So a lot going on with them. So the brains are obviously reprocessing information and, and creating culture. That's why we, we assume quite a lot of communication. And some of the early cave paintings may well be theirs. Um, and then of course was they're finding heaps of different species that we're adding to this list. Particularly with the use of DNA, because DNA is fairly robust and you can get the stuff out of um, uh, some of these samples, some of these uh, finds. And uh, it's giving us a much better indication of, of, of some of these other homo species. So there's, I'm not sure what they call the rig deer cave people. They must have a species name by now, but they were found in China not so long ago. Denisovans, this all sort of happened in the last 20 years. Homo antecessor in Northwestern Europe. Naladi in South Africa. There's also another species that's been found in Northern Africa. Uh, Luzonensis, found on the uh, island of Luzon in the Philippines. There's lots of new species being discovered. Which is you know, bring interesting conversation about where the hell we've come from. Florensis is a really interesting find less than 20 years ago now. 
on the far island of Florence, which is just not far from Bali and Timor, and therefore not far from the Northern Territory. They're interesting because they're smaller. And our evolution, as soon as getting bigger and our brains getting bigger, they shrunk. But so do all the animals I live with. So it's all interesting task for you to think about. It's coming up. I won't give too much away just yet. And of course, you've got us. Modern hominids, flat face, erect posture, good big brain size for our body size. Definitely use of tools, lots of ceremony, use of fire, use of symbols, use of language. Lots of stuff going on. There's sort of two main theories. One's preferred over the other. Um, of how we got to be where we are. And the out of Africa theory suggests, this is a preferred one by most people, that Homo erectus probably had married a million years ago, left Africa, and then Homo sapiens arose in Africa and left about 200,000 years ago. So they've both arisen in the Rift Valley, where most of our species have, but they've both moved out for whatever reason to go in search of other places. It may have been drought or lack of food or whatever, competition. And they've moved on and they've gone out to, to see the rest of the world and spread across it. Plenty of fossils in the Rift Valley and the mitochondrial DNA suggests that our mitochondrial Eve is here in that Rift Valley. And we have these pathways of her uh, descendants moving across the, the planet. And that's all using mitochondrial DNA. Alan Thorne, who was a uh, important uh, paleontologist at the Australian National University who said he died recently uh, was a great proponent of parallel evolution or regional continuity where he said yeah yeah okay Erectus left Africa about a million years ago but then at, at various locations around the globe he's evolved into Homo sapiens and many of these new species are sort of suggesting that there's the finds around the world that suggest a whole range of new species that may well have been forms between Erectus and Homo sapiens um, but the evidence tends to point towards out of Africa, really. So he uses that sort of idea here. Now, <clears throat> it's an interesting place where these guys, if they come across this ocean, if that's an ice age, 150,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, then these land bridges are low. But he, Thorne dated Mungo Man at about 60,000 years, so there's, there's an interesting little gap here which puts Aboriginal heritage back maybe to that ice age before, 150,000 years. And that's not time enough to walk from Africa and get here. That suggests some intermediary space that they've come from. But anyway, that was Thorne's argument. Um, so how long have they been on the continent? Well, we know they came through from Asia. We know they island hopped. There's potential for some uh, Polynesian genes from uh, that actually originate in South America and come across the Pacific Ocean, which is amazing. They certainly were here after the last ice age, 11,000 years ago, but we're seeing remains and middens and artwork and things that are pushing that back beyond 60,000 years, and some would argue 100,000 years. So how they got here becomes an interesting question. But they certainly came down through Asia. And we see this movement through these islands where the water is much lower and these islands are much bigger. So those gaps are quite small. So they're very short journeys. Uh, we're still seeing people using uh, these boat people using these islands to so island hop to Australia because it's only that last gap we need to get some distance. Um, so it's doable. Anyway, I got there without taking more than 15 minutes, but I did rush a bit, sorry. We'll speak more in class. I'll see you next week.